Well, here we are, Easter Sunday, but it doesn't really feel like Easter, does it? When I think of Easter, I think of packed worship services, brass accompanying the choir, the great procession into the church, singing, Jesus Christ is risen today, hallelujah. I think of all the wonderful Easter outfits, the seersucker suits, the beautiful dresses and hats to match, All the families gathered around the flowering cross taking their pictures. I certainly don't think of an empty sanctuary. Nor do I think of escalating cases of COVID-19 or field hospitals under construction in Charlotte or rising death tolls. In so many ways, it just doesn't feel like Easter. And yet... When we turn to Mark's gospel, what is likely the first version of what happened that first Easter morning, we are reminded that it didn't happen in a packed sanctuary amid all the pomp and circumstance to which we have become accustomed. That first Easter happened in a very different place. It happened in a place like this. It happened here, in a cemetery, just as the sun was rising. It happened with three faithful women coming to anoint the body of their Lord, who was brutally killed three days earlier. It happened in the haunting quiet of an empty tomb, with no crowds, no choir to announce the good news. It happened with a young man in a white robe who told them something impossible to understand in their presence. This strange Easter morning, let us listen anew for God's word to us from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Now, O Lord, grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. That first Easter wasn't anything like a normal Easter. Where were the emotions of our Easter? Where was the joy? Where was the celebration? Where were the triumphant hallelujahs? Instead, Mark's Easter offers very different emotions for those first witnesses. They were alarmed, frightened, bewildered. Any of that sound familiar? We encounter these emotions when the world as we know it ends. And that's what happened for those three faithful women who made their way to the tomb early that morning. In many ways, it's happening to us in the midst of this pandemic. Daily life has been upended, the economy paralyzed, community relegated to the virtual world. Watching the news, we wonder when the peak will be, how bad will things get? When will this all end and we can get back to normal? Will we ever get back to normal? Frightened, alarmed, bewildered. It's what we feel today. It's what those faithful women felt that first Easter morning. It's how we feel when the world as we know it ends. 
In our fear, our alarm, our bewilderment, we wonder what the future holds. The women did. How would they get into the tomb? Who will roll away the stone? How will we move forward? And so too, we wonder about the future. A wide spectrum of projections gives us plenty to worry about. Some project an incredibly dire future, death tolls beyond anything we've ever experienced. Anything since the pandemic of the Spanish flu with its millions of deaths. Everything will change. Nothing will be the same, they say. Their version of the future is defined by the virus, disease, destruction, and death. Others embrace a more optimistic narrative. Efforts to flatten the curve are helping. It won't be that bad. Predicting this will all end within a month or so. Things will likely peak soon. Everything will get better. The economy will recover and life will return to its normal busyness and hectic pace to sustain ever-growing markets. While these projections serve some purpose as it relates to planning, on a deeper level, they provide an illusion of control, of predictability in the midst of all this uncertainty. Maybe that will ease our fear, our alarm, our bewilderment. In his latest book, The Art of Loading Brush, Wendell Berry offers a critique of our predictions about the future. He asserts our efforts to predict the future are really attempts to control it. Pandemics have a way of reminding us we are not in control. Barry writes, we want sometimes desperately to know what is going to happen. We want a prognosis, a projection, a prediction, a contingency plan, a, a posture of military readiness. And for this clairvoyance, we turn to the scientist who supply the answers. But these services cannot be properly valued until the future has become the past. He continues, there is then nothing in our dealings with the future that is substantive enough to justify our fevered obsession with it. Projections, predictions, futurological visions, contingency plans, like our dearest hopes, are continuously fretted and crumbled as the possible futures shrink through the needle's eye of the present into the singular past. In conclusion, he writes, it's obvious that we would have no privilege from living in an entirely predictable world. On the contrary, our privilege, if we will accept it, is that we live in a world that finally is not predictable at all. Where I am at home with other people and other creatures I actually love and know, and where I have work and pleasure waiting to offer me the ordinary luxury of being dead to myself and alive to the present world. Can we possibly imagine living in the present? That first Easter, as the women worried about their future, about who would roll away that massive stone, and in the midst of their present, they encountered something strange, a surprise. That huge stone was already rolled away. Anyone predicting what they might have found in that tomb would have forecast a dead body. But instead, they find a living young man in a white robe who tells them something beyond their wildest dreams. Do not be alarmed, he says. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. He is no longer in that tomb defined by their present. He is already present in their future, in Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Who could have predicted that? In a world where the dominant story is either the virus's fear, death, and destruction, or the power's projections, control, and optimism, who could have predicted resurrection on the other side of the cross? Who could have imagined that from the midst of death, God would bring life. On a conference Zoom call last week with retired preaching professor Tom Long, 
He put it this way, we think we can control and manage the future, but we have a God of surprises. We do not know how God will bring life and hope out of our present, but we are confident that it will happen because it's happened so many times before. He went on to quote New Testament scholar Christopher Morris, who wrote, the task of the disciple is to be on hand for that which is at hand, but not yet in hand. We are to live expectantly, hopefully in the present, trusting in God's Easter promise to surprise us with life again and again, even in the midst of death. How might we claim that surprise right now? Well, it begins when we live most fully in the present moment, whatever it may hold. This present moment has great power in it. Rebecca Solnit has recently released a a timely book entitled Paradise Built in Hell. It speaks to the power of this moment. In it, she chronicles human responses to various cataclysmic events in history, from the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 to Katrina, to New Orleans, to 9-11 in New York City. By lifting up responses of those directly impacted, she suggests better worlds can be found within such catastrophes. Maybe we can find it in a pandemic. She writes, we speak mostly of happy and sad emotions, a divide that suggests a certain comic lightness to the one side and a a pure negativity to the other. But perhaps we would navigate our experiences better by thinking in terms of deep, and shallow, rich, and poor. The very depth of emotion, the connecting to the core of one's being, the calling into play one's strongest feelings and abilities can be rich, even in the face of death. And what is often assumed to be the circumstance of happiness sometimes is only insulation from the depths. How could this present moment take us into the depths and the richness of life. What surprises might the God of Easter have for us, living more deeply in this present time, even in the midst of such suffering? We tend to want to avoid suffering at all cost. But Franciscan monk Richard Rohr asked, in this time of suffering, what are we going to do with our pain? Are we going to blame others for it? Are we going to try to fix it? No one lives on this earth without it, he continues. It is the great teacher, although none of us want to admit it. By trying to handle all suffering through willpower, denial, medication, or even therapy, we have forgotten something that should be obvious. We do not handle suffering. Suffering handles us in deep and mysterious ways that become the very matrix of life, and especially new life. Perhaps this is the way to live in the strange present in which we find ourselves. And what of the future? What would it mean for us to trust God with our tomorrows? What would it mean to believe that the risen Christ is already present in our Galilees, calling us to go and meet him there? What does the gospel story, that that story of life and death and resurrection, that story of God's power to bring new life on the other side of every cross we face, what does that story, our story, have to teach us about the future? What if the challenges of these days, what if the cross we are enduring now might mean a better world tomorrow. Rebecca Solnit writes, many no no longer believe that a better world as opposed to a better life is possible. Sometimes it seems as though home improvement has trumped the idealistic notion of a better world. She wonders what might happen where hope is fiercer and dreams are larger. Dare we dream of a world that more closely reflects God's vision? Dare we hope for a world that looks more like the beloved community that is God's tomorrow? 
what we call heaven, the kingdom of God. Dare we imagine a future not sustained by the idols of our present day, not by our illusions of control, nor our avoidance of suffering, nor by our denial of death, but by the power of the risen Christ who promises us new life on the other side of every cross we face. That would take great faith, faith that is willing to live most fully in the present, whatever the present holds, even if it's a pandemic. Faith that is on hand for that which is at hand, but not yet in hand. Faith that lives into the Galilees of God's tomorrow, for surely Christ will meet us there, just as he told us. Those first witnesses, the faithful women, Upon hearing that, they fled the tomb, seized with terror and amazement, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Of course, they must have said something to someone because we're all here 2,000 years later. What will we do?